x x x x minus 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 one 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 hey everybody welcome back to the dungeon dive uh that was a little intro for x minus one i don't know if you guys listen to um old time radio at all I, yeah old time <laughs> It sounds hilarious when I say it. I'm sure a lot of you out there are listening to old time radio. But if you are not listening to old time radio, I highly recommend you do. Um, there are some amazing old time radio dramas and all of it is like in public domain basically. And so you can get it on YouTube and in podcast form. And there was an amazing series broadcast in the from like the 50s through the 60s called x minus one and x minus one was a weekly series that did adaptations of classic science fiction stories from the golden age and it was probably my introduction to classic science fiction long before i was reading uh the material and I recently restarted listening to the uh, to the X minus one series. There's a YouTube playlist that has like 130 episodes, and I've been you know classic science fiction, golden era golden era science fiction, Ray Punk stuff has been in my mind recently. And so I decided to set up and play again Space Cadets Away missions. And I was reminded almost instantly by how much fun this game is and how much it accomplishes with not a lot of stuff. It's one of those games that if you know if you were to look on paper and think, well, I don't know, like what does this game really have to offer? with such limited components and you know the art is not fantastic the tiles are the tiles can be pretty boring but what this game has to offer in terms of gameplay is just a ton of excitement and some really neat ideas so i just wanted to talk a little bit about space cadets away missions so it's 2015 from stronghold games and then also talk a little bit about some science, some classic science fiction anthologies that I uh, recommend. So I am here, I'm about halfway through a mission here. One of the reasons why this game is so good is that it comes with just a ton of missions. Now, if I, I, you guys know I hate this size of rule book. It's trying to read it, you have to like, fold it over and I know that they, they wanted this game kind of needs a big rule book because of the way things are laid out but I would much prefer a smaller rule book easier to get onto the onto the camera hold in your lap read on a couch that kind of thing but one of the things that this game that has this this one of the things this game has going for it is a large number of missions to play and almost all of these missions can be played with two to six players or rocketeers as the heroes are called in this game. I believe there's only one mission in here that can only be played um, with a single, a, a, a solo mission. Everything else can be played with two to six. So you get a ton of missions. The missions have a big variety in objectives, in layouts, in ways that it uses the components in creative ways. Nice little flavor text for the story that you're gonna be uh, participating in. And so really neat. Uh, this game packs a lot of gameplay into a single box with not a lot of stuff. I like that. Another thing this game has going for it is the rule book. You know, while the Kickstarter games are often the games that get people like us excited. It really is the tried and true games from established um, companies, designers, developers that really know how important it is to focus on a good rule book. And this rule book is fantastic. Everything is written very well. Tons of repetition. Repetition is so important in a rule book. 
in order to connect the dots when when components and mechanisms when they're interlaced with each other and you you don't reinforce that through repetition in the rule book by you know saying you know a and b work this way and then later on when the rule book talks about b it also you know loops back and mentions a some rule books don't do that and it's really frustrating because you're you're constantly having to flip back and forth to remember certain things but this game ha this rule book has great repetition tons of pictures with examples that's one thing i failed to mention in my last review for d6 is that in the rules section there i don't think there is a single picture example of what it's talking about using components from the game uh, Space Cadets is the exact opposite. It has tons of pictures of the components, tons of examples. And so everything you need to know is in here. It reads well. The whole back of the book is like a super detailed um, extended play example with pictures and text, highlighted areas, arrows. I mean, it's just, it's all so well done. And then you get this huge like detailed list of all of the enemies, the heroes, the items, what they can be used for, how they are used, when they are used. Just A plus rule book. Um, one of the best that I know of. And then you also get these really nice uh, player aids. So you get this overkill summary. I'll go over the overkill system in a minute because this is what really makes this game shine. But then you get a turn uh, sequence that lists all of your actions. Um, a rule summary for the different aliens you're going to be fighting. Uh, some definitions for the aliens overkills. A whole detailed list on the aliens turns. So uh, the documentation in this game is fantastic. So even though the art isn't amazing, the minis aren't amazing, it doesn't have a ton of table presence, it is a complete package that has a ton to offer. So what you're doing in Space Cadets Away missions is you are assembling a team of rocketeers going on missions inside uh, mostly spaceships and space stations and space bases, some alien, some human, and you are moving through, you are exploring these hexes, these tile hexes that are going to be uh, placed in such a way that they're going to form different maps and you're going to have hatches that will form corridors and doors that can be opened. And you're, each mission you're going to have an objective that you have to uh, solve and some of those are you know, extracting alien blood or maybe turning off some kind of crazy alien machine. This particular mission here I'm trying to kill this boss named uh, Tyranno or Tyranno. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to say it, but Tyran, sometimes I pronounce it Tyranno and it sounds like uh, an owner of a circus. And then Tyranno, like a Tyrannosaurus or something, that sounds like a, uh, that sounds like a, a, an enemy. But your, um, your rocketeers, your heroes, um, there are six of them. And on their little character sheets, you have a cool little backstory here, which is pretty well written. You have a list of the actions you can take. You have their overkill action, which again, I will get to. And then you will have um, this place here, this middle section here, where you assign basically an initiative number from one to six. And then you assign a number of action point tokens and as you play on your turn, when you've done one of these actions, you just slide your token over to show that it's complete. Super cool, super effective, easy way to tell when you've done something. Because the first thing you do on every turn is you do a scan uh, action. And that's how the map is revealed. And at the beginning of every turn, the, each Rocketeer has to do a scan action to reveal part of the map. And so that is kind of how the game balances because with more Rocketeers on the board, you're going to be revealing more spaces, thus revealing more aliens. So the, I guess you could say like the shit hits the fan much faster with more players. With only two, which is how I usually play, you can control the chaos a little more. And then another thing you have, you have a number of um, HP tokens or HP, which you're going to keep track of with these red cubes here. 
you have a number of oxygen depending on how many rocketeers you are bringing onto the mission you get that many number you get a certain number of um, oxygen tokens these oxygen tokens you know if you ever run out of hp you die one hero dies game over if you ever run out of oxygen you die and if a hero dies game over but these are a currency that can be spent to take any action so you have a pool of extra actions you can take but you never can never use that last one and there are enemies and situations in the game where you will be forced to lose oxygen so it's a really neat mechanism almost a push your luck because you have this pool of extra um, actions you can take but you never know if you're going to need one or two to survive some kind of um, catastrophic event on the map and then additionally when you um, form your party of rocketeers you get to choose from this deck here these rocketeer items you get to to come up with your your loadout for each of your heroes and each hero can bring in four items one only I believe it's only one large item but there are different weapons like a flame gun you can get um, an air knife which is like a, your melee weapon and this is really important to take on some missions like this mission I needed to take an, an air knife because it's one way to extract alien blood and in this mission I'm trying to kill this boss but I'm also trying to extract some of its blood to take back for research you can get like stun grenades uh, different kinds of mines demo charges uh, ray guns so like these guns are really good at close range not so good at long range the opposite goes for the atomic rifle which is not so good at close range but better medium and and it can still hit pretty far away and there are various things like a holster which makes your ray gun more powerful headsets so some of these are for certain characters only and so this allows the first officer to uh, give commands basically allows them to to give actions to other players tools and tape recorders space bandages um, a soft focus lens a flag a teleradio more tools so yeah so there's a good variety of items one thing i forgot to mention on the characters their last stat here is an iq stat and this the iq is used for various things on the board and you also sometimes have to uh, research items so if you can see on the board here each of the non scan unscanned uh, tiles has when you set up your board you're going to put an alien token and a discovery token and then when that is flipped over you're going to set it to where the arrow matches the same direction as the starting tile and then you're also going to reveal the discovery token and the alien token so the discovery token will often be a discovery item or a, um, a material that you can use to research. And then it will also reveal your um, the aliens that you're going to be fighting. In this particular scenario, there are no brains. Some of the aliens are these little uh, brains in jars there. But in this particular scenario, whenever you reveal a brain token, you actually spawn one of these big uh, sentinel guys. So I've been fighting a lot of these guys in this mission. So that's how scanning works and that's how the different tokens work. Now some of the tokens are also you have these tile markers and these are used to randomize different tiles on the board. There are two tiles here that have this tile marker. One of those spaces is this Tyranno guy that I'm trying to fight. So once I scan this, I would flip that over and find, and if one of these is a decoy or one of them is the actual boss I'm trying to find, then I would substitute that tile. The reason that that is like that is sometimes these will slot in to, sometimes the tile markers will actually have um, some kind of, some kind of consequence and they will be slotted in onto the tile to represent something so that's why you just don't shuffle in the tiles the discovery items some of them have a cube um, icon up here that means that you would place three green cubes on those items and then that can be used that many number of times 
and some of them are called schematics. And schematics, you have to have components to create them. So this, uh, if you find the teleporter in one of the discovery items, you could take this card. But in order to build the teleporter, you have to get a piece of wire, a piece of mysterium, which will appear as a discovery item, and you have to pass an IQ test. And so that's where that IQ stat comes in. The wires you can never find. The way you get wires is one of the enemy types is called a thrall. Now repeat after me. Rocketeers can never attack thralls. Rocketeers can never attack thralls. <laughs> thralls are, um, are humans that have been mind slaved by the aliens and so these are actually you know normal humans that the aliens have uh, taken over and so you don't want to attack them you want to subdue them and to subdue them you do an IQ check and then you're able to kind of like you know reverse the effects of the mind control and then if you get an overkill which again I will talk about in just a minute then that thrall can become a ally. And so you can rescue them and then you get a little bonus depending on the, um, depending on the human that was mind slaved and these will all give you a certain bonus. So you wanna try to subdue thralls and do it very well. So let's talk now about the overkill system. And I don't know why more games in this genre, dungeon crawl kind of adventure games, have not like just flat out ripped this system off, done a, uh, a variation, um, a derivative. Uh, it's just like, this system is so cool. So let's say that my chief Lance DeSoto here, which is kind of out of the, out of the screen, but he's kind of like my fighter guy. Let's say that he was going to attack one of these saucermen. Well, right now this door is closed. So we would have to say that this hatch is open. Opening a hatch takes an action. All hatches remain open for a complete turn. Then at the beginning of the next turn, during like an upkeep phase, all hatches close. So I was wanted to shoot one of these saucermen. So we can look, take a look at the saucerman card. Most um, aliens only have one hit point. And so this card, each of the enemies has a card that tells you all of its stats and also has their initiative in the corner. So you can very easily just keep these in initiative order. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And on, when it comes time for the aliens to take their, their turn, you can just go through each one, look on the board to see if you have any. Really easy to keep track of, super nice system. But I want to attack one of these aliens with um, Chief Lance DeSoto. So I would use an action point. Now, Chief Lance DeSoto, he has two regular actions and one action that has to be used for combat. So if this was his first action on his turn, I would go ahead and use his combat action first in order to take his attack. Now these guys are one away, so I would look at my atomic rifle here. If they were in the same spot, I would roll 2d10. They're one away, so I would roll 5d10. So you take your super nice sparkly space dice, and then you roll. Successes are a 1, a 2, or a 3. Anything else is a failure. So let's see if I can actually roll something good here. Okay, nice. So I've got a one and a three. And then, whoops, that was a one. And then these are all misses. So when you uh, calculate your hits, your successes, the first success is a hit. And that does damage. So I would do one point of damage to the alien, thus killing him. Any additional successes become what is called an overkill. And an overkill lets you spend those additional successes on a number of different effects called overkill effects. Every weapon or item or many items that you use have an overkill effect. So I could spend that additional success here 
to dislodge, to move one alien in line of sight, one tile. So I could push this alien onto a different tile. And yes, aliens can move on unexplored tiles. Rocketeers cannot. I could push him this way. And then maybe um, Dr. Hugo Garcia could um, fight him. So that's my first option. The second option is that each character has their own overkill effect. This guy, Chief Lance DeSoto, his overkill effect is called a strafe. And that allows him to do kind of like a strafing fire where he can target additional enemies in different in adjacent tiles as long as he has line of sight. So he could spray, you know, his his laser fire around and take out additional enemies. You can do it once per tile. So I could spend that overkill to take out this other saucerman in that tile. By the way, I'm saying saucerman because uh, instead of saucer man, just because I think it's funny. Uh, I'm sure some of you are aware of Slender Man. You know that that copy um, copy pasta internet lore stuff. But uh, my wife and I call him Slenderman because we think it's funny. So Saucerman. Um, the next thing you can do is each enemy has their own overkill effect. So the Saucermans, you can have them do a psychic scream because they get hit, they die, and they let out this psychic energy. And that can stun certain enemies in their tile. So there are all kinds of options. Every Rocketeer has their own overkill option. Every weapon has its own overkill option. The aliens have their own overkill option. Aliens as attackers, when aliens attack, they also get to spend overkills and it's pretty deadly. And then also your IQ actions also have overkill options. So it's a really neat system because a lot of times when you're rolling in these kinds of games, when you're rolling your dice pool, you know, you want to hit some number as a target number and you go, oh, look at that. That like this roll here. One, two, three. That's four successes. In most games, like you're only looking for one success. Every other cool thing you do on your turn is wiped out. It doesn't matter how many successes you're getting. You usually only need one. Well, this game allows you to take that success and then also gives you these options to choose how to spend your other successes. Just such a fantastic system in this game. And it, it, it's, it is one of the main things beyond the great documentation and just the fun gameplay. It is like the, it is the main thing that elevates this game to what I think is such a high standard. Um, really fun game. I wish maybe there was an expansion that kind of maybe added a little more narrative variety while you're on your missions maybe just like a you know it could be a simple deck of cards that adds a little bit of of you know of unknowable things that are happening inside the spaceships while you are but it it, it also is a pretty tight game in terms of uh being kind of puzzly and you really do have to um plan your actions pretty strictly so one thing I like to do is I put all of my uh, minis just in this box here because this game, like I said, reminds me of my childhood of classic science fiction and these all these like little army men being green. So that way I just kind of like rummage through them like I'm looking through a box of Lego or army men or something. But that's just a little aside. Um, I picked up these recently and every token in the game fits in one of these little boxes, which is really cool. I always like it when that happens. So man, I have nothing but positive things to say about Space Cadets Away missions. It's a game that I don't think gets talked about enough. Um, I think a lot of people, when they see it, they think it, it's just kind of like a silly game maybe. The cover is is not bad. I have a bunch of stuff in the box. I can't show you the cover, but you can find it online. But I don't know why I don't hear a lot of people talk about it. It seems kind of like a forgotten game. So I just kind of wanted to bring some more attention to it and um, say that it's a really good game. And if you like classic science fiction, I have a few little 
anthologies to uh, to show. I think I've shown these before, but these are really cool. So the short story is one area in which um, science fiction excels. I think science fiction is better, and especially in this classic science fiction, in the short story form. Unfortunately, the short story is kind of a dying... Uh, it's, it's, it's a dying form of fiction, especially in America. Back in the day, there used to be a ton of just great anthologies of science fiction. And a lot of these can be picked up for not a lot of money. One of the best here is The Treasury of Great Science Fiction, edited by Anthony Boucher, who was also an author, classic science fiction author. And this double set is amazing it had, contains so many great stories so like this volume one here you have stories by anthony uh, boucher john windham ray bradbury robert heinlein philip k dick henry cutner and seal moore cm cornbluth uh, theodore sturgeon this story here the widget the wadget and the boff for a long time this was like the only place you could find that that uh, story it's actually a novella uh, Paul Anderson, A.E. Van Vaught, um, great collection. The second collection I don't think is quite as strong until you get to the last entry. So you have some Paul Anderson, Judith Merrill, Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein. I mean, pretty good, but you get to the last um, section, the last entry, and it's The Stars My Destination by Alfred Bester. So for those of you who haven't read Alfred Bester, who haven't read The Stars of My Destination, if you like science fiction at all in any capacity, you have to read The Stars of My Destination. It is often, if not considered, one of the best science fiction novels ever written. Many scholars, sci-fi scholars, consider it the best science fiction story ever written. It is a masterpiece. 19... 56 and it is actually ground zero for cyberpunk like almost 30 years before neuromancer uh 28 or some odd years before um what is this bruce bruce bethke bethke um coined the term cyberpunk this book this story has or it's a novel has you know, cybernetic implants, it has bullet time, it has uh, large corporations who have taken over planets, and it has everything that would become cyberpunk is in this no uh, novel. And I just wanted to read this beginning. I love this opening paragraph, it's so good. This was a golden age, a time of high adventure, rich living and hard dying, but nobody thought so. This was a future of fortune and theft, pillage and rapine, culture and vice, but nobody admitted it. This was an age of extremes, a fascinating century of freaks, but nobody loved it. All the habitable worlds of the solar system were occupied. Three planets and eight satellites and 11 million million people swarmed in one of the most exciting ages ever known. Yet minds still yearned for other times, as always. The solar system seethed with activity, fighting, feeding, and breeding, learning the new technologies that spewed forth almost before the old had been mastered, girding itself for the first exploration of the far stars in deep space. But where are the new frontiers, the romantics cried, unaware that the frontier of the mind had opened in a, lab in a laboratory on Callisto, a laboratory, laboratory, <laughs> laboratory on Callisto at the turn of the 24th century. A researcher named Jaunt set fire to his bench and himself accidentally and let out a yell for help with particle reef reference to a fire extinguisher, particular reference to a fire extinguisher. Who so surprised as Jaunt and his colleagues when he found himself standing alongside said extinguisher 70 feet removed from his lab bench? So uh, the name Jaunt, uh, if you guys have read uh, Stephen King's amazing short story, um, it's longer than you think or further than you think. I think it's longer than you think about jaunting. So he took that term. Jaunting becomes the term that in this novel people use to teleport. 
So fantastic. Read Alfred Bester. And then uh, just a few other little uh, collections here real quick. Uh, yeah, once a long time ago when people said they actually read Playboy for the articles, they weren't lying. I have a lot of old issues of Playboy because they have authors that I love. And in those old issues, you kind of have to like, it takes, you have to like search for the nudity. Yeah. <laughs> It, it really was like a magazine with great articles and with great fiction and they would often collect their fiction and so they have this series here of science fiction uh, stories that were originally published in in Playboy. Stories by Arthur C. Clarke, J.G. Ballard, Ray Bradbury, Sheckley, Slessor, Sturgeon, more Ballard, Arthur C. Clarke, more Ray Bradbury, so all kinds of great stuff. And then finally, I, I really like these covers. These first three, uh, so these are edited by Frederick Pohl. Um, these first three are amazing. The last two I haven't read, but I don't really recognize many of the authors. But the first one I have, but it is falling apart, so I keep it in a bag. But again, Alfred Bester, Disappearing Act, which is probably my second favorite short story of all time. Theodore Sturgeon, Lester Del Rey, Anthony Boucher again. Um, Ray Bradbury, Gerald Kirsch, Richard Matheson, you know, um, wrote a whole bunch of uh, Twilight Zone, Isaac Asimov. So yeah, uh, it's really fun to, to buy these old collections. They're not very expensive and you can often find them, you know, at, uh, at library sales or used bookstores for not a lot of money. And you can order like whole lots of vintage science fiction collections from eBay for pretty cheap and tons of great stuff. So if you're into science fiction, if you're into a Space Cadets Away mission, I recommend both. And I also recommend listening to X-1 on YouTube because it is a lot of fun. Old Time Radio is a really good way to exercise your imagination because it's all audio. So you really have to think about the environments and the way the characters look and the action that is happening. I think I really do. I credit X minus one and um, Lights Out. I really do credit those two old time radio shows as um, really powerful forces that helped shape my love for all things genre and my overactive <laughs> imagination. So, all right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Highly recommend it. Space Cadets Away Mission. Fantastic game. If you don't have it, pick it up. So talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.